and to come here and tell us something about digital humanities. I think all of us know that digital human humanities is a key word which at least in our country is quite fashionable, even in the circles of the Ministry of Education. So uh, we may get some insight and also some suggestions uh, how to uh, propagate digital humanities in our environment. Please take the floor. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much, of course, for the, for the inv invitation. It's me who has to, uh, to thank for uh, getting the opportunity to speak to you. And um, um, yeah, I, I think I can, I can skip the introduction because Eva just um, <coughs> pointed out why digital humanities is, so, uh, is such a hot topic currently. And I'm, what I'm trying to, or what I'm trying to do is, or what I've been working on uh, for uh, for a couple of time now, is trying to um, get a better grip on on what exactly digital humanities means or could mean. And actually, if you, if you go to some digital humanities conference. Um, you will inevitably have discussions about the right definition of digital humanities. It's kind of an <clears throat> yeah, ongoing, uh, very much debated things. And there is even a book defining digital humanities. But of course, it's, um, well, since we are talking about humanities here, it's 300 pages and not actually a definition in there, but mostly different views. <clears throat> and then and there is also a, a very nice website, whatisdigitalhumanities.com, which um, each time you, you, you visit the site, it gives you another definition of digital humanities from a pool of about, I think, 800 definitions or so. And some of them are, are quite, are, are pretty wild uh, definitions. Some are, you probably could agree with them. and. But there is a huge variety of, of, of different definitions. So <clears throat> um, you could, of course, ask, well, do we really need a definition? And there are some people who say, well, no, I mean, you know, we are a big tent. Everyone is invited. And we can all be friends. And of course, this is, this is, a, this is good, but um, this is not a definition either. And I think we need a definition of what digital humanities is. Because if you want to create a program of studies, for example, or if you want to devise a research agenda, you have to um, commit yourself to, to, to some kind of definition. You have to say what direction your research wants, uh, is, is supposed to go or what you want to teach your students. <clears throat> and the problem currently with, with most definitions that you find in the literature or that you, that you hear at conferences and so on, is that, that they mostly focus on methods and say very little about goals. And a, related, uh, a closely related problem is the question that, is also, that people also like to discuss at length is whether digital humanities are a discipline of their own, an, an interdisciplinary field, a community of practice, or something completely different. <clears throat> um, there is a, the only thing maybe where there's a relatively broad consensus is that the digital humanities somehow bring together computer science and, and humanities. So there must be there there are, there are inherently two two um, two aspects um, in in this thing. Namely, one thing is um, that there is work on humanities research questions using methods and tools from computer science, and there is the other side work on computer science methods and tools for tackling research questions in the humanities. So the term, the term digital humanities is inherently ambiguous. And it could, as it's currently used, it, it could, could mean 
either of these or something else. And <clears throat> I won't go through 800 definitions uh, of digital humanities now, so I just picked one definition at random. Um, it just happens that it's from my 2012 book, um, Natural Language Processing for Historical Texts, where I, in, in, in the opening ch chapter I try to outline how natural language processing and, and digital humanities and uh, historical texts could come to each other, and there I, I, I give a definition of what I thought at that time uh, were digital humanities. It says, the emerging field of digital humanities aims to exploit the possibilities offered by digital data for humanities research. The digital humanities combine traditional qualitative methods with quantitative computer-based methods and tools, such as information retrieval, text analytics, data mining, visualization, and geographic information systems. And it's, <clears throat> I don't show this definition here because it's, it's, um, because, uh, it's, it's uh, outstanding, but it's actually, it's rather typical of, at least if you look at, at the, the reasonable definitions, um, this is, something like this is, is what, you, what you're probably gonna find. Um, <clears throat> but after, after some while um, of thinking about what, we actually mean by digital humanities and, and, and um, working in this area, I thought, well, um, here I say um, it's, it's a combination of, of qualitative and quantitative methods. That's what digital humanities are. And they thought, no, that's, it's not really, it, this is not really true because there are some aspects to what you would like to consider digital humanities that are not quantitative in nature. For example, um, the creation of resources such as uh, digital editions, which provide you with text that you could then apply NLP to. So this is not, this is of course, this is not um, quantitative. So I <coughs> revised my definition in 2013 and introduced the differentiation between digital humanities in the narrow sense and digital humanities in a wider sense. Digital humanities in the, in the narrow sense is basically the definition from 2012, which says um, in, the, in the narrow sense, digital humanities refers to the application of quantitative computer-based methods for humanities research, usually complementing traditional qualitative methods. And <clears throat> I introduced the new uh, secondary definition in a wider sense. It may also refer to the application of computer-based tools in humanities research um, not necessarily involving quantitative methods. And I give the example of uh, creating a digital edition of historical texts or literary texts um, of, of, of something that is not digital humanities in the narrow sense because it does not involve quantitative methods, but it is in, in the wider sense. And for some time, I, I, was, I was quite happy with this definition, because, and I thought, well, that, now that's it. I've, I've nailed it. But after um, some more time working in this field and thinking about um, digital humanities, I felt that <coughs> um, this definition is, is uh, well, does have some flaws, uh, after all. Uh, first of all, it's actually only a description of practices. As I said, it's, 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 it's quite typical definition as it focuses on, on methods and tools and practices, but it doesn't really say why you want to do this or what the advantage would be of using uh, quantitative methods or, 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 or not, and, or computer-based tools. <clears throat> and the most serious problem actually, um, perhaps, is that this definition implies, uh, both the, the, the from 2012 and the, the revised definition implies that there, are, that there are two kinds of humanities. A digital humanities, whatever this is, and, and non-digital, perhaps analog uh, humanities, and these are two separate disciplines or, or fields or, or, or whatever. And <clears throat> I believe, uh, or it occurred to me, that this cannot be true because 
all humanities dif disciplines like uh, literary studies, history, uh, philosophy, musicology, and so on, what you have, they have their specific objects of research. So um, dealing with, with literary texts or historical texts or, or, or music or images of art and, and so on. They have their specific objects of re research and they use whatever methods are, are needed or are appropriate. So this means these, the, the, the humanities disciplines are defined by their research objects, not by their methods. So you make a distinction between, <clears throat> between uh, literary studies and, and history of art because one studies literary texts and, and their production and their circumstances of their, of their production, and the other studies images or, or of, of, of the fine arts. Um, and the methods don't really uh, are not really important there. And you, you see in all humanities disciplines that there is a mix of methods. And tradi even tradi in, in traditional uh, studies, you can find um, uh, quantitative methods used. Maybe not computer-based, um, maybe only on a small scale, but you do, certainly do have uh, quantitative methods in, in history, for example. This. Uh. So, <clears throat> um, now, it, yeah, this, this, I was, so I was uh, kind of dissatisfied with, with my definitions and, um, well, actually I'm a, I'm a computational linguist by training and it occurred to, occurred to me, well, uh, maybe I should look at the history of computational linguistics again. Because <clears throat> linguistics, um, if you consider linguistics a discipline of the humanities, then it certainly has a vantage point for observing whatever is happening in the, in the digital humanities because linguistics has essentially completed the trans transition from armchair linguistics to a pretty hard empirical science using formal methods. And um, I thought maybe this could teach us something or this could be helpful for defining digital humanities. And um, <clears throat> this is, um, you could, if, if you look at computational linguistics um, from a very high um, point of view, you would say there, there are two, essentially two types um, or two, two um, yeah, types of activities that are, that are covered by this term. On the one hand, you have theoretical computational linguistics, which also used to be called mathematical linguistics, and I, I see in this institute very much has this tradition of mathematical linguistics, which covers fields like formal language theory, grammar theories, and, and these kinds of things. And on the other hand, you have applied computational linguistics, which is sometimes it's called corpus linguistics, sometimes natural language processing, where you use, uh, where you apply these theories and methods to some concrete language, such as Czech or German or English, and, and actually write grammars. And so you can say, this you have a theory of formal modeling for linguistics, and you have the application of formal modeling in linguistics. So, oops, <clears throat> you could really say, so what I call theoretical linguistics or mathematical linguistics is actually math or computer science, but it's in, in that area. <clears throat> and the applied computation linguistics here, even though it may have a different department or, uh, in, 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 the, in the university, you could say, it, well, it's actually linguistics because the research questions are linguistics. You want to know how some construction works in, in German and you're writing a, a formal grammar in order to study, <coughs> to, to study German or Czech and, and, and in order to study the, the, um, the construction and, 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 and your description of it. Um, yeah, so this is, this is what I just said. And now, <clears throat> so, yeah, theoretical computational linguistics studies the means and methods of constructing formal models in linguistics, and applied computational linguistics concerned with the construction of formal models of natural languages and with the methodology of constructing such models. The question is, can, can so the first one is, is actually a meta science because it, it, it studies studies the um, methods 
that are used for some um, for for some other research, uh, whereas the applied computational linguistic is, is is a science. Now, can we can we apply this this to digital humanities as well? Does this help us? I think yes, it does. And um, I came up with the brand new twenty well. Pretty new uh, um, uh, uh, to 2016 definitions, and instead of uh, one definition or one definition with two sub definitions, I have two. Uh, I have two, two separate definitions, and I define digital humanities as this, um, the study of the means and methods of constructing formal models in the humanities. And I have a second definition or actually a set of definitions and I'm using uh, as I, I'm using history as an example because I've worked at a historical institute uh, so digital history is concerned with the construction of formal models of historical circumstances and with the methodology of constructing such models so <clears throat> um, this means that digital history creates concrete formal models of its research objects. So you have a particular historical research question. What was the cause for World War I, for example? This could, could be a research question. It's a popular one. Uh, actual historians are, of course, working with much more um, <clears throat> fine-grained uh, research questions. But something like this is a, is a historical research question, certainly. And you're creating formal models to study this particular uh, question, and correspondingly, of course, you could say, well, you have the same thing in digital philology, dig digital musicology, etc. You could call it applied digital humanities, and these are these are not disciplines of their own, but these are just subfields of their disciplines, or if you want to call it, even call it a subfield. It's just that you're doing some some research in history using a particular set of methods when they're useful, and. <clears throat> Um, the, the digital humanities would then be uh, uh, what theoretical computational linguistics or mathematical linguistics are, a meta science. They are concerned with, the cons with construction materials <clears throat> that you need in order to, to build formal models um, for in particular disciplines. And of course, just like in computational linguistics, there is no strict strict boundary between digital humanities and applied digital humanities. I put it in in quotes because it's not an, not an established term. And of course, if you're if you're um, if you're uh, studying construction materials, you may also be interested in in their application, and vice versa. If you're if you're using um, <clears throat> Um, these construction materials, you may also be interested in their properties and maybe do some research in, in a particular area that is of particular importance to your application. But this is the same thing as you have in computational linguistics. So um, here's some, yeah, you could call it example. It's, an, it's not a, um, well, I, I'm thankful to Kerstin for uh, giving me the example, but it's, it's not fully worked out, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. But if you look, if you, <clears throat> if you consider um, um, philological studies, uh, where people construct uh, or create um, editions of either literary or historical texts, and what they do in, in, in philology is usually is, is they are annotating Texts with with information about um, what they find here, particular rhetorical structures or um, annotation of persons and, and their background and annotation of places and, and events and and um, uh, diplomatics. That is how the well the, the here is a delete or this character was deleted and later on somebody else, there's a second hand that wrote something over it and a third hand that annotated the thing and, and, and so on, these, these kinds of informations. And <clears throat> so you need, a, you need some tag set, just like in, in, in computation or in linguistics, you need some tag sets to, to annotate the phenomena you're interested in. And of course, you need some annotation 
guidelines to say, well, if you find something crossed out, you mark it as crossed out and you annotate the original content and the, and, and, and the type of, uh, of deletion, for example. And you could say, <coughs> um, to, and this, uh, the, the, this, the definition of the tag set and the definition of the annotation guidelines is what I would call, uh, or what you could call a digital philology. It's, it, this must be, this is research that is driven by, by philological needs and philological insights and philological practices or best practices and, and uh, experience. On the other hand, <clears throat> you use, if you're creating a digital edition, you're of course using, using technologies uh, such as um, uh, XML, um, XQuery, you're using either inline markup or you're using some type of standoff uh, annotation for your text. And these um, this is, th these types of um, technologies are certainly not a research topic in philology. And I don't think they should be a research topic in philology. Um, but this is rather computer science. So you could ask, well, is then digital humanities, according to my definition, is this the same as computer science? I would say not quite. Um, but rather, um, um, digital humanities, according to my definition, is computer science, is, is the intersection of computer science and the um, specifics of humanities. So you have the same situation as with mathematical linguistics or, or theoretical com computational linguistics, whatever you want to call it, or a similar situation where you have, <clears throat> you, you have some aspects of, of mathematics or computer science formal language theory, but you're not, consider, you're, you're not necessarily interested in all of it, but you're interested in, in, certain, in certain subsets that are of particular relevance to the study of linguistics. Uh, and the same is here, you're not interested in, in digital humanities, you're not interested in all of computer science, um, but you're interested in, in, in specific parts of, of it uh, that are of particular importance uh, to applications in the humanities. And some of these things that are of particular importance in, in most, if not all, um, humanities disciplines are uh, representation of vagueness, handling of, of incomplete data, which is particularly important if you're dealing with historical stuff, because historical stuff is often incomplete, because it was, it, it bur half of the library burned, so you don't know what was in there, or, um, <clears throat> or your manuscript is torn and you're missing one edge. You're dealing with uncertainty. You may not know whether something is original or fake. Um, and of course, you have uh, all kinds of specific requirements that um, result from the specific research questions, which do not come from computer science, which, but which come from humanities, um, which come from the humanities. And I think uh, the most important part of computer science probably that you need in, in, di in the digital humanities is knowledge representation. Because what you're <clears throat> most of what you're, what you're doing is, is uh, representing knowledge about text, knowledge about images, knowledge about music, uh, knowledge about historical events, and these kinds of things. Um, so now what is the... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the role of formal models in the humanities or where, where I see the application of formal models in, in the humanities. Because, of course, um, um, you could say something, yeah, if, if, if you know a bit about the history of science and, and, and philosophy, you could say, okay, yeah, I mean, back then, I don't know, Frege, for example, these, these, these guys, they wanted to formalize all, uh, all science and didn't work out. Now, this is not what I'm, what I'm proposing, obviously. Uh, just, I mean, I, I know I'm <coughs> uh, preaching to the choir here, but just um, to, to give a little bit of, of a framework, um, uh, some, some introductory words. 
Um, so a, a model is a representation of a selected part of the world. And you could call, you could call it a description or a theory, but I, I think the term model is, is probably best because a theory in particular in the humanities has some connotation that you rather want to avoid. So I think that's why I'm using the, the, the term model. So we're talking about formal models, and uh, so the question is, of course, the, the next question is, what, is a, what, what does formal mean? And I have a very nice definition here <clears throat> from a 1969 book by um, Gladke and, and Melchuk, which I'm um, very fond of. And um, they say, the word formal means nothing more than logically coherent plus unambiguous plus explicit. So there's really no magic in here, and in particular, <clears throat> there are different degrees, obviously different degrees of formalization. Um, we all know this, you could, could have some semi-formal description of, of something and then formalize it even more. And of course, if we're talking about digital humanities, we are primarily interested in, in a degree of formalization that allows models to be processed and manipulated by computers. Just like in computational linguistics, that's the, I mean, somehow the, uh, the key. Um, <clears throat> you could do it up on paper, you could uh, write formal grammars on paper and evaluate them, but it's much more fun if you have a computer do it for you. Um, and not, not just more fun, but it's also um, allows you to do um, uh, the really interesting things. Now, <clears throat> if you look at at, um, at, at, at science and humanities, you can say that all disciplines construct models of their research. Because in order to understand a complex object, and with object I mean anything that is being researched, so this could be a phenomenon or a situation, it could be a historical situation or a historical event, for example, you need to understand the its parts. So if you're talking about history, the, the, the persons and the places that, that play the role and the documents and letters that were sent and how they inter interrelate and interact with each other. And this is exactly what a model describes. However, in contrast, of course, to the natural sciences, <clears throat> models in the humanities are traditionally not formal. And that's not directly accessible because they only exist in the, in the scholar's head. And the narratives, um, so this is what the, the, the main form of communication in, in history, in, in his historical scholarship, is the narrative, which, is, which usually comes in the form of a, of a monograph. Um, these are not models, but they are actually informal descriptions of models. So the, the, the scholar has the model in his or her head and then describes this model in a, in a readable, nicely readable way in a narrative and, and publish this as a, as a book. So, um, now, if I say Dutch humanities is, is about formal models in the, in the humanities, how do they fit into the research process? Um, so, the, the traditional research process um, could, could be said to look like this. Um, so this is mostly about, I'm using, his, again, history as, as an example, but it apply, basically applies to other humanities disciplines as well. And of course, um, this is a very simple model. Uh, but I think um, it captures the, the essential parts uh, of, of, the, of, of the historical research process. So <clears throat> I think I have some text for this as well, yep. So you have a scholar, and the scholar reads and interprets primary and secondary sources. So this is a large part of, 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 of the research work in, in, in history. And the facts that you extract from these sources and the insights that you gained by, um, by reading these sources are usually recorded as what I call working materials in a variety of forms. This could be notes scribbled on paper or uh, typed into some Word documents or 
Um, <clears throat> but they also exist in spreadsheets. Some, some of my historian colleagues are very fond of creating spreadsheets with the, with the kind of, what could say, dramatis personae, so the, the, the act or, or families that, that play a role. Um, some of them create databases um, to record facts, publishing dates of documents and descriptions of their contents, all kinds of things. And then, <clears throat> after reading and evaluating all, all sources and creating the, the working materials, then the, the, the scholar constructs a mental model in order to answer the original research question and then describes this model in a narrative. If you, one big problem with this, with this process is, and this is the reason why um, historical scholarship, for example, advances at a much slower pace than, for example, particle physics, <clears throat> is um, that building on the wor work on, of, of others is, is pretty difficult. Because now here you have the, uh, the, the first scholar who produced the, the narrative, and then you have a second scholar who wants to work on a, on a similar topic and maybe wants to use uh, the, the, the knowledge or the insights or the, wants to build on the work of, of the scholar before him. Um, <clears throat> but since, uh, so this basically means that this, this book here produced by the first researcher goes into the stack of sources just like all the primary and other secondary sources and has to be read and interpreted in the same way that the that the primary sources have to be interpreted. And of course, all um, interpretation processes are prone to, uh, to errors or to interpretations that differ from the original intention. So what you have, um, well, you could start here. Here, you, in, in this head, you have the full model. This, only, this is a description of a model which may leave some parts away because they are they, they, are, they don't make for a good narrative, so you leave this away. <clears throat> and then this scholar reads this, this description and constructs his own mental model, trying, of course, the original intention is to try and reconstruct this model here. Of course, this, historians don't say this. I, I'm trying to reconstruct the mental model of, of Professor X, but this is essentially what they do. You try to understand what, what this author meant by writing something. And you get come at your own conclusions, which are, which of course you put again down into in, in your working materials, and then revise and, and read, and then in the end produce your own narrative, which of course in some way builds on this one, but um, the connection is a not not a very direct one. So <clears throat> um, now I'm not saying well some. You, you could think that I'm proposing to replace the narrative with a formal model. And I say, I, of course, you could say, well, historians should stop writing books and they should instead <coughs> publish their research results at, as, as formal models. Now, um, no, this is not what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I'm proposing. Um, but I think the role of the formal, uh, of formal models in, in the humanities is where you where we used to have these working materials. And um, if you, so this is the point where you gather all the, the information and knowledge that you extracted from these sources and you're representing them in a, in a formal way. And so this, and, and you know, for, formal is, is not magic, but it just means that you're being explicit. <clears throat> And instead of making some vague uh, illusions, you're saying, okay, uh, I have this person here and this person is identical to that person. And you're just putting down your notes in some way that a computer can handle, basically. And then, of course, <clears throat> as I said, this, the, this formal model here does not replace the narrative because the narrative is something that is targeted at humans. And as a human, you're, you're much more likely to enjoy reading a good uh, a good book is rather than uh, parsing um, prologue facts or uh, <clears throat> something. So this is not replaced, but 
the narrative is something that comes out of this, this formal model. This is, again, of course, just like it's like a narrative today is based on, um, on, on, the, on your working notes. Your narrative is based on, again, on your working notes, just that the, you, you formulate the, your notes in a way that a computer can manipulate them. So you, you still have the traditional narrative, but as a bonus, you can also, since the formal model is, is, can be processed by the computer, you can do all kinds of other things with it as well. For example, you can process it automatically and create all kinds of new analyses, visualizations, whatever. And these, for example, a visualization may help you actually to refine your model. This is why the, the arrows go in both ways. And you may say, see that something was missing in your model and you may <clears throat> want to add this uh, or correct this because you've, it's very hard to, to automatically analyze your, your handwritten notes automatically and, and draw some conclusions from it. But you can do it if, you're, if, if you write down your notes in a way that the com computer can process and then the computer can show you that there are inconsistencies or missing things or noteworthy things um, for example, that most of, your, most of the documents that you read are from a certain period of time, and this may be what you intended, but may also indicate that there is a skew in the sources that you evaluated, and you may want to evaluate some more sources or earlier sources or later sources and or these kinds of things. And <clears throat> the other thing is that this would uh, actually bring collaboration in the humanities on yeah, on a higher level. Um, because instead of going through narratives and, and analyzing and in interpreting narratives, um, if you have, again, these two researchers, <clears throat> you could directly connect these formal models to each other, so link, to, link, link them. And of course, again, this goes, um, this goes both ways. Um, so insights gained by this researcher from, from his sources and, and recorded in his uh, model may again help the first researcher to refine her, her, her model or to expand it or to, um, or to correct it. So this is, <clears throat> um, when, I'm, so when, when I am talking about formal models in the humanities, this is basically what I have in mind. Um, yeah, these are some um, additional points I, I like to I like to make um, regarding first regarding the question of quantitative methods, which I have to which I had in my first definition and in many definitions you you, you find are. Quantitative methods are, are, are very prominent in, in these definitions. But actually, if you look at it, <clears throat> humanities research questions and results are primarily qualitative. And this also means that digital humanities are primarily qualitative. Of course, this does not exclude the use of, of, um, of quantitative methods. It's just that you don't have quantitative results, but you have qualitative results in the end. You may use a variety of methods to, to, reach these, um, to reach these results. And I'll state again that I think <clears throat> also for this reason um, that knowledge representation is central for the creation of formal models in the humanities. Uh, just like uh, theory of formal languages is important for linguistic <clears throat> models, but of course you could also say this, this is also kind of knowledge representation because you're representing grammatical knowledge in the form of rules or statistical models. <clears throat> but in the, in the um, digital humanities, uh, it's, it's less about grammars but more about knowledge representation in, in, in a classical AI sense, if you want. Um, just... <clears throat> A few words on the role of natural language processing, because of course it, um, yeah, because I'm a computational linguist, and of course this is a question that often, that often comes up, <clears throat> or that, um, or of course, natural language processing is something 
that people who use digital methods in the humanities want to do because they, they automatically want to analyze their, their sources and, and um, do stuff with it. And so this is also, uh, you wonder how, how natural language processing fits in. Um, and my take on it is if the humanities seriously want to base their research on large quantities of, of text and, and quantitative methods that natural language processing gives you, they will need natural language processing as a basis for all higher level analyses. And it's, the important thing is that the humanities history, for example, is of course not interested in linguistic structures. They are interested in on the, in, 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 the cement, in the in the hard part, in the semantic part, they are, they, do, they are not interested in how something, usually they are not interested in, in the grammatical structures that are used in, in some historical document, but in the implications uh, of it. What does it mean? But of course, in order to analyze meaning in whatever way you want to tackle this problem, you first need to understand the underlying syntactic uh, and morphological structures. And so, so that, certainly natural language processing plays a very important role in, in, um, in digital, um, digital history and, and other applied digital humanities. And this means, again, this is this from the view of, uh, point of view of history, this means for digital historical scholarship, natural language processing must then be regarded as a so-called auxiliary science uh, of history, uh, this is not a this is not a negative term. It's just the point of view of historians. Um, from their point of view, it, these are auxiliary sciences because they feed into into history. Uh, similar to established, long established um, uh, auxiliary sciences such as diplomatics, codicology, paleography, numismatics, sigillography. Etc., which are indispensable for evaluating and using historical sources and interpreting them, them correctly. And uh, just like I have a nice quote here from, from 1970, so also very, what you would call today a very old quote <coughs> from Jacques Froger, a, a French historian, um, who said, um, that it's not necessary that uh, the philologist writes the program himself or herself, even if it, even you would like them to do this. Um, but what is important that they have enough knowledge of programming languages so that they control, can control the uh, the work of the uh, programmer. Um, <clears throat> because um, the programmer may not be familiar with the particular problems that the philologist may have. And of course, what you need to add here is um, that the, you have the same problem, of course, vice versa, <clears throat> namely that the historian or the philologist may not be aware of the possibilities and, and, um, and limitations of, uh, of the technology. And of course, this also applies to natural language processing so if, if you want to use NLP methods in, in, in historical scholarship, for example, of course you don't necessarily have to um, write the parser yourself, <clears throat> but you should be aware of what, what is in there and what you may be able to get out of it and what, uh, where, the so where sources of errors may be and, where, um, <clears throat> and, and what, what opportunities you have and what, what limitations are there and what kinds of data you may need to provide in order to, to make an analysis possible uh, and these kinds of things. Okay, um, I see that I still have some, I have some time. So I just, so this is a bit, I'm going to talk a bit about some recent work of my of my own, um, which was of course um, not originally based on, on this definition because it's a new definition, <clears throat> but which where I, I now find ret retrospectively that it actually uh, that it confirms that this is um, 
well, maybe not the right definition, but the, this definition of digital humanities goes in the right direction, at least uh, I think so. And also, this is just to give you an impression of, of what, what we've been, or what I've been up to at, at the Leibniz Institute of European History in the, in the area of digital humanities. So this is, <clears throat> the, the first example is actually a digital edition, and it goes back to, to um, my, my previous employment at the uh, Law Sources Foundation of the Swiss Lawyer Society in Zurich. And this is a digital edition of the Appenzeller Landbuch, which is one of the oldest surviving um, Swiss legal documents. <clears throat> and um, most, of, most of this digital edition is actually pretty, pretty vanilla, you could say. Um, you, have, um, you have the structure of the document, and you have uh, a transcription of the document, and you have a facsimile. But um, what sets, actually sets this uh, edition apart from many other um, ed digital editions is that we try to uh, formally model not everything, but uh, places, persons, and organizations, that is, groups of persons um, that belong together. And this, a part of that is what you can see here. So I admit that it's just... Um, being, I, I'm just hinting at it, <clears throat> um, but this is. But I also I also think that this is um, this is actually a good place to start because uh, if you're if you're reading historical sources, you, you you find persons, you find names of persons, and you're trying to connect these persons to persons mentioned elsewhere, and you're trying to to get at the interactions uh, that there are, and this is a very um, it's, e it's in a way easier than to grasp the semantics of some, of some document, um, but you have something more con concrete to work with, and it's actually something very useful, because if you encounter these same persons in, in another document, then you can immediately make a connection between these documents, <clears throat> and um, you can build up networks of, of persons and their uh, movement or uh, between different places, when they are mentioned to be to, to have lived in one place, and then they are mentioned in, in, in a later document, they are mentioned to have lived at some other place. You already have lots of lots of information that that are not only useful for yourself or for your own research, but which is something that others can can um, make use of, and where others can also contribute their own information that they have from from different documents, and immediately you, you have some connection between these two. Um, research projects. Um, <clears throat> this is some, um, uh, some more recent work, which um, is more, it, it's, it's actually closer <clears throat> to formal, formal, for, to formal modeling. The, the labeling system is, is some work that we've done um, in the context of, um, of Daria DE, you may have heard of Daria, the European um, research um, network on, for, for digital research infrastructure for the arts and humanities. That's what the acronym says. And Daria DE is the German contribution uh, to this uh, EU-wide um, project. And this is some work we've done together with colleagues at the uh, University of Applied Sciences in, in Mainz. And the, the labeling system um, is, is an approach and a, and a prototypical implementation of, of this approach that aims to um, improve the situation with respect to uh, controlled vocabularies in, in the humanities. And controlled vocabularies are, are very, very important for, or play a very important role for for formal models, because they allow you to, to uniquely uh, uh, identify uh, categories or types um, uh, of, of knowledge. But the problem in the humanities is that the um, um, that categories evol evolve, or uh, the, the uh, definition of category is something that usually is part of the research process itself. 
you may, at the beginning of your research project, you may think, well, okay, so there are two types of people, uh, noblemen and peasants. But if you're, if you're, very simply example again, but if you're digging deeper, you may see, oh, no, there are, there are different, they're, actually, noblemen are an, an, a, a homogenous group. There are different types of, of noblemen that play different roles in, in my research. So the categories <clears throat> that, you, that you use to define um, or, or classify your, the, the, the persons you're dealing with evolves over time. And of course, this makes it very difficult to say, well, okay, let's all gather and create a standard for, uh, for categorizing historical persons. Um, this will not work. <clears throat> um, but on the other hand, the current situation that everybody does his, own, his or her own ca uh, categorization is also um, very in, uh, unsatisfactory because you can't exchange data. You can say, well, I've created a database of, of uh, 500 medieval persons and they are all classified according to some criteria. But your fellow researcher may not be able to use this because this classification doesn't make any sense to him. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the labeling system is, is, an, is an approach where we try to, to mitigate this problem um, by using a, what we call a reference thesaurus, which is some int basically some intermediate thesaurus that you, instead of, do, in, instead of writing a natural language definition, you refer to some, to some common thesaurus, which may not be as detailed as it could be, but which gives you <coughs> some kind of anchor where you can connect to, something, uh, to, to, to some other uh, person's research. And instead of uh, another part, another important aspect here is that in, instead of just using one label, you uh, assign um, uh, 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 basically assign a number, a, a, a bundle of concepts to to the labels you use. So it's uh, you say this has something. Okay, we call this X. And this X has something to do with this, and it has something to do with this, and it has something to do with this. So this may, the, the association between the label and the concepts in, in the reference thesaurus may be relatively vague, but at least they give you some, some way to match other people's um, um, categorization schemes as well. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a third um, um, example uh, of some ongoing work, um, we are trying, the, the Leibniz Institute of European History has a, a database um, of um, early modern European tre peace treaties. And uh, this was, it was actually created in, in the, um, <clears throat> at some point in the 90s. And it's, uh, and, and that's what it looks like currently. It's very, it's very, very useful research tool, but unfortunately, you can't use it in any other way but browsing it and, and reading it as, as, as a human. And what we are trying to do is to uh, convert this to linked open data, so that you can actually, <clears throat> so that we have actually a formal model of the of the peace treaties, which say, which makes it explicit um, who were the powers involved, who signed the treaties, um, what territories were um, covered by this, this treaties, and these kinds of things. Um, and while doing this, you notice that the, the, the data collected back in the 1990s it was not as good as, it, as, you would, as you hoped it would be, and so we are currently putting much effort into, into cleaning this data and, and enriching this data so that it can be actually useful. And the last example that I'm going to show and <clears throat> is um, also some, some ongoing work in, in, um, in, in Daria project, this time in collaboration with, our, with, the, uh, with computer scientists in, at the University of Bamberg. Um, the, the, for, yeah, this the, um, the Cosmo tool and actually has some NLP component <clears throat> to it. The idea here of, of this tool is to support um, biographic, uh, yeah, biographical research, so research into the lives of, of, of persons um, with a computational tool. And this tool um, actually, and what, what we have, or we, we model, we, we have actually a formal model of, um, 
form a biographical model, a model of, of person's life, which you, and you can see on the, on the left-hand side, you can see a visualization of this model, which is basically a timeline with events um, that happen in that, in that person's life. And these events are also are, are linked to dates and places, obviously. And uh, what this tool does is it's currently based on, on structured um, on, on, on structured information from, that comes from Wikidata and on unstructured information that comes from, from Wikipedia, from the, from the full text of biographical articles in, in Wikipedia. And the interesting thing here is um, bringing these two types of information together. So, it's, of course, it's easy to use uh, structured information such as um, date of birth, um, place of death and, and these kinds of things that you find in, in Wikidata. But you do not find everything of interest in, in Wikidata. Some of, it, some of the important biographical information is only mentioned in the full text of the, of the Wikipedia article. So we're, what we are doing here is combining these two sources of information. But <clears throat> we're doing it in a, in a way that is useful for historians who need to know where their information comes from. So in this timeline, I, well, I hope you can see it in the in, or at least have, have an idea, some idea in the back of the room. You, you see boxes of different colors and, and um, in different positions. And these, the, the color and the position, uh, the, the horizontal position indicates where this information comes from and how reliable this is. So we, we, treat, um, we treat, treat structured information as, as reliable because we don't know that, we know that there is at least no transmission error. Of course, the, the date given may still be wrong, but there's no transmission or interpretation error. And we treat um, information uh, gained from, from parsing the, uh, the natural language text of, of the Wikipedia article as less reliable um, <clears throat> because there may be errors in, in, in parsing or not, not everything may be, may be identified uh, correctly. And um, this is indicated by these, by these colors and the, and the position on this, on this line. And the historian can, can then can click on these pieces of information, which are actually parts of the formal model, and see where this, in, in this area where this information comes from. The, the exact, um, for example, the sentence in Wikipedia that states that uh, um, the address of the house in Frankfurt where, where Goethe in this, in this uh, context was born and then can evaluate this information and decide whether this is trustworthy or not. And in the future version, <clears throat> or what we are doing now in the third phase of Daria DE actually is that we um, want to um, do ev ev evaluation on, or allow historians to do evaluations on uh, large uh, collections of these um, biographical models in order to identify connections, interesting connection or interesting events for example, you may, um, you may um, if, you, if you have a number, a large number of, of such models, you could <clears throat> discover, for example, that a certain person was at, at some time, at some place where some other person was as well. And this, may be, this is often information that is, that is not known because it's hidden in, in some biographical entries. And you may, that may then find that these, these, these two persons meet again at some later a point in time and so their first meeting may have been instrumental to their second meeting and this may be interesting uh, for all kinds of, of historical research questions. Okay, <clears throat> um, but this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is ongoing work. What we currently have is the, the automatic creation of these, these um, biographical profiles, we call them, but these are actually formal models of, of, uh, of people's lives. Um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, we want to. We're currently kind of working on, on on comparing these these models, and we also want to expand this from from biographies to the history of ideas, because you could say, well, ideas similar have have biographies that in some ways resemble the biographies of of, of people, uh, because they 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 arise at some time and they are spread over over a geographical area, or they they move between uh, between different places and they are picked up and then they move something somewhere else or so. These are currently just vague ideas and we're um, 
uh, trying to do something in that area. So, um, <clears throat> to summarize, um, I think, um, or I strongly believe that the digital humanities do not merely aim to accelerate research or to analyze larger amounts of, of data. Um, because I don't think that this actually, an acceleration is, is nice and it's nice to have access to digital, digitized sources at, every, at any time of the, of the day or the night, um, <clears throat> but it does not actually advance scholarship in, in a significant way. So there must be more to it. And I think the key is formal modeling of scholarly knowledge and insights in a machine processable form. Because formal models increase coherence, precision, and explicitness, and they encourage cooperation and sharing, and they help researchers to directly build upon each other's work. And I think if, as, a, as computational linguists, you would know that this is, actually, this is actually true in computational linguistics. You have corpora, for example, that are reused by, by other people for doing their kinds of research. And this, of course, is based on, on formal models of annotation that you can actually share and reuse. And you, we currently don't have the, of course, there are some limits to it, um, <clears throat> but um, it works much better than in, in, in the humanities. So that's why I believe that knowledge representation techniques are the foremost tools for creating formal models in, in the humanities. And the ongoing and seemingly never-ending discussion about what the human digital humanities are can benefit from studying the de development of linguistics, I think. And the digital humanities subfields or applied digital humanities can benefit from, um, from studying corpus linguistics as, a, as some way of applied computational linguistics. It's not con concerned with the with formal languages, but with the application of these, <coughs> uh, of these modeling techniques to some concrete research questions in linguistics. And if we talk about uh, natural language processing, from the point of history, it should be considered an auxiliary science, and as such, scholars have to get acquainted with its methods and tools. And uh, with this, I close my, my talk, and thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much for, <laughs> for the invitation. Thank you. <clears throat> so, first question. Or comment. If you disagree, oh. feel free <laughs> to say so. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe one question. Uh, I think that one of the uh, most important points in the development of uh, linguistics to formal linguistics was the ability of running uh, experiments, mm -hmm. uh, running and evaluating. While uh, you can, uh, it's hard to do anything similar in mm -hmm. in history, unless or at least not in the democratic <laughs> countries. Yes. <Yeah>. So, uh, <laughs> is it limiting, or can you uh, avoid the need of for experiments somehow if you want to evaluate the quality of uh, hypothesis? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, this is obviously a good point, and it shows that while there are similarities, there are also differences to, b between history and, and linguistics, for example. And um, <clears throat> um, of course, you, can, you cannot evaluate the, the quality of, of historical models in the same way as you can evaluate the quality of, of linguistic models, such as grammars, for example. You, 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 you apply them to a corpus, and then you, you see what the coverage is, for example. 
of course you can't do this and I think this is this is exactly why why knowledge representation is is the most important part here because you also need to um, you not you're not dealing with with facts but you're dealing with interpretation of of uh, information gained from historical documents and you may legitimately differ in your opinion. So what we also need to represent is to say, well, scholar A um, said that this is the case, but I, or scholar B, uh, disagrees on the grounds of some other document, for example, or on the grounds of some other information gained from other sources. Um, and th this is, I think, this is the, um, and in, in, if, if you're, if you consider historical research, for example, this is the way that you can um, test and refine your models. You cannot, you cannot run experiments, obviously, but you can, you, you can, exp you can support the discussion. So this is a, actually, this is of course what is what is being done today already. Um, but it's a, it's a very slow process, and um, people are often get caught in discussions about um, about terminology um, <clears throat> without many, making any progress. Um, but if if you're dealing with, with um, I, I think this, so you ha still have the same discussion process. But I think the discussion process is much um, is is, is so very much supported by having formal models because then you can exactly pinpoint what the problem is. You can say, I, I agree with, with, with that part, but I don't agree with that part. And my own suggestion would be this. And then you don't need to discuss um, whatever the, the, the terminology used, but you can, you can exactly pinpoint uh, the parts you disagree with. And then, of course, other researchers would be, would be able to see, oh, there's some disagreement here. I have to make a choice. Do, do I support this, uh, this view or this view, or do I have a third view? So th this would be my answer to it. Of course, you can't run experiments, um, so you need something else. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>